Vamos a empezar con la exposición de María Palante, que eh, estudió Derecho en George Washington University. Tiene un largo recorrido como experta en materia de propiedad intelectual. Ha trabajado con dos organizaciones gestoras de derechos de autor, también en la fundación del Museo Guggenheim durante ocho años en temas relacionados con el copyright. Desde 2007 trabaja en la Oficina de Copyright de los Estados Unidos, donde es directora adjunta para la política y los asuntos internacionales. Comparte con el Consejo General la responsabilidad del asesoramiento para las actividades normativas y regulatorias de la oficina y asiste a la directora de la oficina en el asesoramiento al Congreso, a agencias gubernamentales, a tribunales y en general a la comunidad en materia, jurídica en materia de copyright. Pues adelante, María. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I uh, will not talk about the details of our study because it's been referenced, but uh, I think as you all know now, we did an in-depth study in the United States and published a report primarily on the causes of the orphan works issue and the extent of the problem, and then uh, proposed in our office, the Copyright Office, a solution uh, that was fairly conservative, that basically reflected the views of our many stakeholders in that uh, we preserve the cause of action uh, for the copyright owner in case they emerge, uh, but we limit the monetary recovery so that the user can actually assess what their exposure would be. And that has all kinds of implications for commerce because if you can assess what your exposure is, then you can figure out whether you want to take the risk, whether you can get insurance, what that insurance would cost, how you pass through the liability to downstream users through the distribution channel. And for us, therefore, it was a very pragmatic approach. Uh, as is often the case with proposed legislation, uh, our initial recommendation was one page. The legislation itself was one page and uh, basically just said what I just said. And uh, the legislation that we ended with in the last Congress was uh, 10 or 12 pages, depending on the Senate or the House bill. And the bulk of that uh, had to do with expanding the search definition and, and the requirements. So I'll spend some time talking about that. Uh, if uh, you haven't looked at our bills and have any interest. The most recent bills are Senate Bill 2913 and House Bill 5889, which you can get by going to thomas.gov. That's Thomas as in Thomas Jefferson.gov. And uh, I will say that we, we had a, a series of congressional hearings uh, over the years, over three Congresses, and those uh, included certainly cultural organizations and collecting institutions, and that's how I came to the issue initially as in-house counsel for the Worldwide Guggenheim. Uh, just from a pragmatic perspective, what do we, how do we move forward? How do we clear rights? But not only as the user, but also how do we turn around and give title to others? Because as those of you who work in cultural institutions know, um, making a leap to take the risk and use an orphan is only half the issue. Once you make use of it, uh, especially in a prominent cultural institution, then people come forward and you're doing your job, you're achieving your mission by putting works out there. But then everybody wants to use it and they want you to give them permission to use it. They want you to indemnify them, they want you to tell them that they can go forward and make their use and you can't do that if you don't have title. So, uh, uh, in, in our discussion and in our, our fact finding at the Copyright Office, uh, Cultural institutions were part of the debate, but by they, they were by no means necessarily the engine that drove the discussion. One thing that was very clear to us was that we needed a solution that applied to both nonprofits and commercial entities both. And so right off the bat, we excluded the possibility of an outright exception in our law for orphan works, uh, because we did not think we could craft a sufficiently narrow exception that would meet the requirements of TRIPS Article 13 uh, in scope and uh, allow the kinds of commercial uses and, and pu public-private partnerships that really uh, uh, are how books get published, for example. So even if a museum wanted to make a use and put it in a book, they would need a for-profit publisher to distribute that book. And the for-profit publisher would turn around and say to the museum, for example, we understand that you're making use under an exception, uh, 
However, you're, we still need you to identify us because we don't have any exception that applies to us as a commercial entity. So we excluded that right off the bat. Uh, that, that's an important thing to understand. The other thing I'll say just as a threshold matter is that we've been talking a little about, a bit here and there about the search requirement under US, under the US proposal, but you can't really understand how we got to the search requirement without under, and how we got to the limitation on remedies model without understanding our registration system. It's directly linked to the fact that in the US, if you register your work, it's a voluntary registration system, but if you register your work prior to the publication uh, or within three months of publication or prior to the infringement, then you're eligible for statutory damages. And statutory damages can range up to $30,000 per claim. So what users were telling us is that the reason we're not taking a risk and using a work, even where it's very old, is because there's always a chance that it's been registered. And if it's been registered, my exposure is outrageously expensive. And if I'm trying to get insurance as an, a commercial entity, or if I'm trying to contract downstream, we're always going to go to the ultimate possible exposure for purposes of the contract. And that just creates gridlock. So um, I would just keep that in mind as I speak that uh, for us, the limitation on remedies was a limitation on statutory damages. We were essentially taking statutory damages off the table, even where a work had been registered. Um, and you know, because our registration system was mandatory in our country up until 1978, uh, when we went to the voluntary system, and we were very worried that nobody would register. And so in order to induce registration, statutory damages were introduced as a primary incentive. So we have all of these kind of policy discussions that happened offline from the orphan works debate, but which very much influenced it. And uh, registration is important in our country because when you register, you supply two copies of the work to the Library of Congress, and that is how it builds its national collection. So all of these things were at issue kind of offline, but very much important. So let me talk a little bit about the search. So the, the conditions for eligibility are primarily that you do a search and that you document the search prior to the use. Also, you have to provide some kind of attribution to the copyright owner for transparency purposes because the underlying policy goal is that the copyright owner will come forward at some point. Uh, one fundamental principle underlying the entire orphans discussion is that there would never be a permanent orphan work uh, if a copyright owner is out there. That if I do a search that meets the requirement and I go forward and make the use, uh, the next person that comes along can't rely on my search, can't piggyback on my information, but has to do her own search because in the interim period, the owner may have come forward. That, that was a goal uh, to match and to, to make copyright owners aware, especially where they're heirs, that they may in fact own this copyright. The symbol um, was a controversial issue, but again, went to transparency. Essentially, the register of copyrights would be charged with creating some kind of orphan symbol for transparency to signify that it's an orphan work. There was a great discussion about at what point in time the orphan symbol would have to be used, and many uh, owners, copyright owners said, that should be a requirement, say, 30 days before you make use of the work. But copyright users said that would essentially create a copyright troll problem, right? All kinds of people would come forward and say, that's my work. Uh, it's got an orphan symbol on it. Another interesting uh, thing that happened with that discussion was that photographers and graphic artists and some of the smaller copyright owners who were very worried about this legislation came forward and said, um, if you have a symbol on the work for transparency, what's ultimately going to happen is that some technology company is going to put together the mega database of orphaned material. And as a labor issue, that will mean that people will just go to that database, not because they want the benefit of the limitation on the remedies, but because they're going to assume de facto that that stuff's pretty safe. And why license from living, breathing photographers if you can just use the stuff that's in the database? So we had, a, again, a sort of a labor discussion intertwined. Okay. Uh, 
This seems very simple, right? A search qualifies if the user undertakes a diligent effort that is reasonable under the circumstances to locate the owner prior to and at a time reasonably proximate to the infringement. Um, this took two years to discuss and ended up I had some fun on the plane playing with my PowerPoint tools. <laughs> uh, there became a great discussion that there should be a series of minimum steps that everybody would have to undertake no matter what, followed by a series of sort of recommended steps. And that was the ultimate compromise struck in the bills and uh, continues to be the source of the discussion that we have on Capitol Hill. One of the things that a lot of copyright owners thought was mandatory was that at a minimum you should have to search the Copyright Office records, right? Well, easier said than done. Post-78, all those records are online. Pre-78, they're not online yet because they're in all different shapes and sizes and very difficult to digitize and extremely uh, fragile and we have preservation issues, but they're not easy to search. You essentially have to pay somebody that's in DC to do that for you or come yourself not cost effective if you're making a low value use. On the other hand, what about the things that are online? That seems easy, right? No, because uh, if we're talking about visual images, it doesn't matter if it's registered or not or whether you can search, you can only search by author, title, publisher, and registration number. Uh, if all you have is a photograph with no identifying information, you can't even begin to commence your search. On top of that, we have something called group registration in the United States for photographs, which means you can register hundreds of photographs at one time under one person's name. Uh, so even if it's registered, uh, you can't find it. And what that ultimately means is that the photographer may be entitled to statutory damages, but not even the photographer can tell you what's actually in the registration records. And again, that became a source of, uh, of consternation. And these things are all self-evident, but um, they just uh, were extra things put into the statute. Technology tools, um, again, you would think it's pretty straightforward. Why not use them if they're available? Well, if you're a nonprofit making an educational use, the fear became that some technology tools and some sources of information would cost you money. Right? That private companies would spring up and say, sure, I can find that work for you, but you have to pay me. And ultimately, you may have to pay me more than you would actually um, make from making use of this work. And those, again, became cost issues. The search, including actions based on facts known at the start of the search and facts uncovered during the search, um, my colleague from Hungary said this morning that uh, in, the principle basically is there is no finite list that you can just check off that you, you're done. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you don't necessarily have to do the same search that everyone else does. It really has to take on a life of its own, almost like a missing persons search. So this is where we end it, uh, except that the Register of Copyrights was charged on top of that minimum list with coming up with recommended practices. And what this really means is that we would probably do a notice of inquiry and put out to the different industries and users their recommendations per segment. What do libraries do? What do publishers suggest? What do motion picture companies suggest? And as a user, you would look at the statute, but you would also go to our website and you'd say, here are some recommended practices. Do you have to do all of them? No. But if you ever ended up in court, uh, you'd have to explain why not, right? That was the thinking. Okay, so I mentioned statutory damages before, but back to cultural institutions. For cultural institutions who often have older material, they came forward and said, what you're suggesting is a statutory framework that takes statutory damages off the table and instead requires us to simply pay reasonable compensation if and when a copyright owner shows up. That's already what we do in practice. You're doing nothing for us. Uh, the works in our collections come from abroad. Lots of them are unpublished. Um, lots of them we don't know if they were published or not. Lots of them we don't even know what the origin is. Uh, lots of them are unique. And in our estimation, very few of them are actually registered. They come to us from 
collectors, from people cleaning out garages. They come to us from uh, all kinds of private dealers, and they come kind of in boxes. And when we do a provenance search, which we're very good at because we're cultural institutions, uh, our, our experience tells us that the, the Copyright Office is the last place we're going to find evidence of this. So you need to do something else for us. And Congress thought about this, and they decided that not only were they right, but they wanted to incentivize these organizations to get this material out, because this was the core material of orphaned, quasi-orphaned material that could be of most value to the public. So they put together the safe harbor, uh, and here are all the requirements. The user has to be a nonprofit. It has, there has to be no direct or indirect commercial advantage, which you would think is the same thing, but it's not. So this is a museum uh, making a mission use is fine, but a museum selling a tote bag with an orphan work on it in their gift store, not fine. And uh, that you have to stop using the work. And if you do all of those things, then you would not have to pay that, at all. You just have, you can, you can make the decision, I'll pay and go forward or I'll take it down. And also keeping in mind that the payment might be very, very low if you're, if you're engaged in all of these steps. So that was a very extremely important uh, provision. It was somewhat controversial because commercial stockhouses of photographs wanted to compete with some of these organizations uh, and wanted to monetize these kinds of collections. And although they might not have the exact same historically important information, they might have things like it. And they didn't want uh, only the nonprofits to have the benefit of the safe harbor. So this is like a mini exception within the limitations on remedies regime. And finally, uh, there was an injunction issue. There was a strong feeling, particularly from the book publishers, that you couldn't have a model that was about limiting remedies without also limiting injunctions. And uh, the motion picture companies became very concerned about this because for them, sometimes the injunction is the only thing they want. They would argue that uh, reasonable compensation, statutory damages, nothing monetary will ever suffice if really all they want to do is just stop the work for, uh, from being out there. But uh, as it stands now, an injunction is still available unless it's been embedded into a new work where it would be so difficult uh, that it would destroy the new, the new use. And the thinking is obvious, that if a user goes to all of the trouble to search for somebody properly, to invest in a new work and to get it out there, then to come along and kill it and take it off the market would just defeat the whole purpose. Uh, I am positive that the injunction language in some form will continue as we, dis we continue our debate in the US. Am I okay in time? Two minutes. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. There were some provisions against bad faith actors. Uh, this is really the good faith user gone bad, where they go through the search, but then when the owner shows up, they start to get difficult. And this came because photographers basically told us that it, it's not that users don't ac accept that the photographer is standing before them and saying, that's my work. What happens to them is that they say, sue me. <laughs> and they know that the photographer can't af afford to do that. So this was really a kind of a club given to photographers to compel the actual payment, to, to actually get them the check. Uh, I just want to say um, that the Google Book settlement is the reason that we haven't uh, reintroduced the bills this Congress. That obviously does not require a search until after the fact. That's a settlement. It's under class action law, not copyright law in the US. The US government strongly opposed the settlement in its current form uh, for out of print works, not on the basis of the scanning, but on the basis of the new kinds of uses that were introduced into that settlement, which are commercial sale and distribution of the books without prior permission. The thinking is that if a search is not required for those kinds of uses, it'd be very difficult to require a search for nonprofit uses. And how to reconcile those two things is the discussion that we're having on Capitol Hill right now. Thank you very much. Thank you.